Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 19. Acts, chapter number 19. As you turn there, just want to tell you that uh, we are starting. I don't know what's going to happen with all these series I've got. I've got three different things going on right now. And so we're turning to Acts, but we're starting to Ephesians. So there we go. What? Oh, too much. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I don't know. Ephesians chapter, Acts chapter 19, I want to read to you, we're just going to read verses 1 through 8, get some uh, context, and then you're going to have to listen fast. I got a, man, I got a lot to cover, um, I'm going to take my time on this, but I, tonight for some reason, I don't know why I put this much in here, but there's just a lot. If I don't get it all done, I'll stop, and then we'll just pick up on it next week, okay? Alright, uh, Acts chapter 19, came to pass, verse 1. It came to pass that uh, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be in Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Verse 5. When they had heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Let's pause there. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. And Lord, I'm, a, I'm excited about this book, and I pray as we start it, Lord, you would give us wisdom. What an awesome uh, Bible you place in our hands. And I, I pray tonight, give me wisdom, give me the ocean power I need it. Pray for you to eliminate distractions. God, I pray that maybe someone who's not followed along uh, yet in this service uh, Lord, this would be a time they pick up that Bible and you teach them something tonight. I claim the promise that says that the Holy Ghost will teach us all things. So if someone's born again in this room, people that are saved, you would teach us this book. And then pray for someone maybe isn't saved. They're not truly born again. They're faking it. I pray you to convict their heart and know the cross of Calvary in Jesus Christ tonight and the blood shed. And they would truly come on bending knee and give their heart and life to him. Give us wisdom through the word. We need it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You be seated. <clears throat> Start the book of Ephesians. We're going to preach through it. I'm not going to be like the preacher. He got through three verses. He's going through the book of Acts on Wednesday night. And so he went through three verses today. We're not going to do that. We're going to do a little bit more, I think. Well, if we can get to the book. But uh, you say, why are we starting out in Acts if we're starting, if we're uh, preaching on Ephesians and through that book, and uh, that's what Ellie said. It was funny that uh, she gave the paper. She said, well, the book of Ephesians, but Acts is on there. Well, you try to get some background. One of the things I love about the Bible uh, is that it, it fits together. And sometimes it gets confusing because we look at the Bible as a book that's in chronological order in the books, in the, uh, each one of the books that's written, and that's just not true. Uh, they they uh, coincide one with another. So if you were going to look at the book of Ephesians, when it was written, it was probably written after this chapter. Paul went to Ephesus, he saw this, and then he wrote to them later, the church that he went and he started there, the book of Ephesians, if you were to put it in chronological order in the Bible, you probably put it right after verse 41 of chapter number 19. So that, that's why I did this, because one, we've got to kind of figure out what's happening here. What is going on? For Paul to write to Ephesians, the, the, the Ephesian people, what, what is happening for him to write certain things so he gets some context? We're going to look at that tonight. But I just want to go through, this is just a, a, the book of Ephesians itself and the chapters. You can, I don't have this on the paper, you can write this out if you want to. But I see in, the, in each one of the chapters there's a theme in it. And it's just a theme that I was studying out this morning early. And I, I see number one uh, in the book of Ephesians that in chapter one, he's talking about the security of a believer, that you're secure in Christ. Um, the second chapter talks about the New Testament covenant, what we used to be and what is now. We're going to re rehash these as we go through Ephesians. 
Uh, chapter 3 it talks uh, primarily about the power of God. You look at chapter 3, you read through it, power of God. Chapter 4 is about unity. You can go back and you can look at all the, the different unified things. He's trying to unify people. Uh, 5 is to follow God's plan. Uh, if you look, uh, it talks about husbands and wives and children. Uh, later on, Ephesians uh, 6 talks about children, but just the plan of God, follow God's plan. And number 6 is the battle of the enemy, chapter 6. And so there's a breakdown of, of that we see in Ephesians, but why does he say all this? That's, that's what my point was with Ephesians, is we're, we're getting to the book of Ephesians. It's, it's God's word, obviously. He's inspired it. Every word of God is God's word. You don't, if you don't know that, let me tell you, every word of God is written by the Holy Ghost. In fact, if you don't know, 2 Peter chapter number 1, or for, yeah, 2 Peter chapter number 1 says that all scripture, it was given... Uh, to holy men of old who spake as the Holy Ghost moved them. Now, I'm not getting it. Let me, let me quote it to you. It says this in verse 19, he says, or verse 20, Knowing this, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy, that's the Scripture, that's the preaching of the Word of God, came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when we have the scriptures that you guys hold, I have you have a Bible, it's important you have one because this is the Holy Word of God. This is what God penned down through man to give to you to read. I was uh, talking to a family Monday night and they were just uh, struggling with Job. They're like, I just don't understand what Job, and I went through and taught them how that the Holy Ghost is what teaches you the Bible. You see, I'm not learning much in the Bible. Well, it's the Holy Ghost's job to teach you the Bible because it's a spiritual book. Um, you, now, there's people of God, and there's uh, you can go to and say, hey, explain this to me, and they can help you, but ultimately, it's the Holy Ghost. If you're saved, say amen. amen. Okay? If you're saved and excited, say amen louder. Amen. Okay? The, the Holy Ghost, God dwells within you. He teaches you this book. Now, let me tell you this. I'll read through it, and I'll read through the book of Ephesians and be like, man, that's awesome. I'll get some stuff that you may not get. That's okay. You all know that, right? That God will speak to you in a different way through the book, but it's all inspired. The book of Thessalonians, this isn't in your notes, so you want to write this in, you can. I don't know why I'm getting on this. But 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and verse number 13 says this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So he says, we're praising, because when you hear a guy preach, or you hear someone teach, or you hear the word of God, you're not saying, aha, that's just some word some God there, and, you're saying, that's the word of God, and that's awesome. And he says it was working in you because you believe that. And so as we look at this, um, these uh, pages in Ephesians, and uh, just show you a couple things in Acts, I want you to realize, man, it is God trying to speak to you. He is trying to teach you his word. And so that's why it's so important. I appreciate the feedback on these papers. I, I, I type these things out. It takes me about... A uh, half hour or so to get these to where they need to be to print them out. And sometimes I'm like, I don't want to do that. But I've heard people say, man, it just helps me. Helps me understand. And th th that's why I give them to you. I don't give them to you to, to make paper airplanes. Take them. If you have a hard time paying attention, get your Bible out. Write down. I leave blanks so you can try to follow along. And so just to, so that you understand it isn't man's words. It's God's words. Okay? Now, I want you to show you a couple things. In uh, the book of Acts, it shows us why Ephesians was written, and I'm going to go to Ephesians, we're going to start it. Number one, I want you to see the call of God. And what's, what's crazy about this is I, I didn't want to put that as the first um, point, but man, it keeps coming up that our, our, um, our um, theme this year in our youth group is the call of God. And so this is what I want you to grasp. I want God, this year, this is what I'm praying for you guys. I want God to give you the call in your life. Now, I'm not talking about missionary or pastor or preacher. Or, uh, that's how I'm saying. I'm saying that you know, hey, I know why I'm here right now. As a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old, hey, I know why God has me in 2024. I know what he wants me to do. I know where he wants me to go. That's the call of God in your life. That's been my prayer. But we see that in here. Look at, look at your Bible. Look at Acts chapter 19, look at verse 1. It says, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, 
Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus to find certain disciples. Boy, I'm going to get a rabbit trail here if I don't watch it. My goodness, I'm going to talk about that right now. Okay. Uh, he, he, um, he has a call. So you see a call. Sorry, that was complete and absolute ADHD right there. Uh, out loud. I need to keep that in my brain. <clears throat> that came out. Uh, so you see God has, or Paul has a call because he sent Apollos was at Corinth. And it says Paul, having passed through the upper coast, he came to Ephesus. He was led there by the Spirit of God. Why was he there? Number one, there's work to do. I don't know if I've got spaces there. I can't remember. I've got so many little points in here. But there was work to be done. Verse number one, he says, finding. Do you see that right there? Look, look at the end of that verse. Everybody, look at your Bible. He says he came to Ephesus and finding. You see that? That was not by accident. He went out looking for, it says, a certain disciples, certain people. There was a work to be done. What, not only that, why, why else was there a call of God? There's work to be done. Number two, he, they, they were willing to hear doctrine. They were willing to hear, do hear doctrine. Look at verse number three. Like I said, you got to listen real fast, but I just want to show you these verses. You follow along with them, you'll get something. He said unto them, What unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Now, everybody look up here for a second. Preacher just preached on this, and I've done this a couple times or mentioned this in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a transition book. They're transitioning from one covenant to another covenant. Or let me put it like this, in case some of you don't know what I'm talking about. A Old Testament to a New Testament. Okay? So the Old Testament was the old letter of the law. It's what they used to do. It's where they used to practice. And God has now put forth a New Testament. And they're transitioning from, from that Testament, the Old, to the New Testament. Now... Uh, the, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, I think it's chapter 9, says there has to be the death of the testator for a New Testament to happen. Jesus just died, and now all this stuff is starting to flip over. So here in this verse, look at verse 3 again. Look at it. He said, and what then were you baptized? He said, unto John's baptism. Now, I don't know if you guys know this or not. We're not gonna, I don't want to study this out too much. I just want to get you to understand what John's baptism is. John's baptism is not the kind of baptism that we do up in the tank there. We are of Jesus' baptism. That is what they call it here. But John's baptism was a preparation baptism. What? Prepare for what? Well, prepare for the New Testament. His baptism was that of repentance. You were supposed to repent, show repentance, and he would baptize you. Well, they didn't baptize in the Old Testament and that we know of in the... And if you look back in the, the pages of Scripture, they didn't. John was brand new at it. So I want you to picture this. They do all these sacrifices. All of a sudden, there's a guy. And the Bible says he he's in, uh, has a, he wear, wears camel skin, and he eats locusts and honey. So can you see him chomping on some, some locusts and then eating some honey, a honeycomb, like the great bees probably flying around. And he's just like, I don't care, sting him. And he's like, you need to get baptized. And... They're like, baptized? What are you talking about? Yeah, immersed. Why am I dunking in water? Well, it's just to show, hey, I had some kind of repentance in my life. It wasn't because they were saved. Jesus hadn't come yet. But there was doctrine to be taught. Okay, look at chapter three or chapter 19, look at verse 3. He said, he said in John's baptism, look at verse 4. Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of, what's it say, class? Repentance. You see that? Saying it to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. So there was work to be done. They were willing to hear doctrine. These people didn't buck against it. These people didn't say, oh, John's baptism is what I'm going to live by. They're like, okay. If that's what God said, they were willing to hear doctrine. That's the call of God that Paul had. So watch this. The call of God in your life, there's work to be done in it, specifically. There's you, you willing, there's people willing, or you're willing to hear doctrine. And then, watch this. The way... That um, there was a way that deceived others. Look at verse 8. He went to the synagogue. Watch this. And went to the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things that were, that were concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were hardened, that's different, that's what diverse means, and believed not, but spake evil of that, what's it say? Way. You see verse 9? Everybody there? Look at it. He said, he spake evil that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannius. And so there's always a way that will deceive others. So watch this. 
This is what I got on this. There's a call of God. I'm doing all this for a reason. I want you to see why Paul comes and writes in the book of Ephesians the things that he does. He has a call of God on his life. He's like, there's work to be done. People are willing. But there's always a way of deceivers. There's always going to be someone that's going to try to push back against your call of God in your life. You all know that, right? There's going to be someone that says you weren't really called. There's going to be people that say you can't really do it. There's going to be dentists that think, oh, that might not work out. You know, right? There's always going to be someone that does that. Okay? And so, right here, Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul saying, hey, uh, we've got all this stuff to do, and Apostle Paul's uh, in the synagogue disputing, and they harden their heart to it. I don't want nothing to do with it. And here's what Proverbs 14, 12 says. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ways thereof are of death. The end thereof are the ways of death. And so watch this. The ways of man causes death. The call of God, called, uh, it, it creates life. And so the call of God in your life, regardless of where it is, there's work to be done. There's, there's doctrine that has to be taught, willing to be taught. And there's always going to be a way that's deceiving. There's going to be someone that bucks against it. And this is what Paul's running into. He goes into Ephesus. And he runs into these people who are like, we don't like what you're saying, bud. And there's caught, there's some deception and there's some uh, disputing that starts to go because of that. Okay? So there's a call of God. Number two, there's a conviction of the godly. There's a conviction of the godly. Now this is verses 11 through 22. If you, uh, I don't, I'm not going to read all of them. But I want you to look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> I'm, just, I'm highlighting this. Again, I'm, I'm trying to teach a lot, but you've got to grasp this. So pick up what I'm talking to you about, but stay with me. Some of you are losing, you're, you're distracted, don't distract, stay with me. Okay, verse 17. It says, And this was known unto all the Jews and the Greeks also <coughs> dwelling at Ephesus. What was known? I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief synopsis of it. It says this, that there's some men that said, I'm going to cast out a devil out of this guy. Well, let's just read it. Look, look at verse 11. It says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So what he's saying right here, hey, this just worked out great, is that Paul, God was doing awesome miracles through Paul. Paul would be like, and then he would give it to people, and they'd be healed just because he had a, a handkerchief or an apron, it said, and people would be healed just by touching what Paul had touched. That'd be pretty cool power to have, wouldn't it? You know? <laughs> I mean, I don't even have to touch him. He'd be like, woo, there we go. He, ah, you know? But that was a miracle. Now watch what happened. Watch. Verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond. Vagabond. You want to see how the word of God comes alive? I, I just got to show you this. Okay. Verse number 9. Chapter 19, verse 1. There's certain disciples. Then in chapter 19, verse 13, there's certain of the vagabond. You see that? I almost preached another message with me. But just showing you how this... But watch. These vagabond Jews are wanderers. That's what a vagabond is. They're exorcists. Y'all have heard of exorcists, right? Don't mess with that stuff. Don't watch that stuff. But watch what he says. Took upon them to call over, verse 13, them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you. So this is what they're doing. Uh, Y'all, you get this? There's a guy that's got a devil in him. He's possessed. And these Jews go to him and say, uh, we call on Jesus, the, uh, we adjure you, that they're, they're casting it, trying to cast this dude out. Look what he does. Look what it is, verse 15. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Verse 14. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and the chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered. Now, I don't know about you, but this is about the time I, I pee my pants. If I'm trying to cast out a, a devil and he speaks back to me, I'm not sticking around there long, y'all. I'm gone. But here's what he says in verse 14 or 15. Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so they fled of that house naked and wounded. So, I cast you out. And he says, oh, really? And the devil comes out of them, gets into the men who were trying to get uh, cast him out, and they run out of there wounded and naked. I don't know why he took their clothes off, but the devil took their clothes off. <laughs> Crazy. Oh, watch this. Now we're at verse 17. Look at verse 17. And this was known unto all the Jews and Greeks, also dwelling in Ephesus, 
And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts. Watch this. Hey, listen, listen, listen. Brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them about, about 50,000 pieces of silver. Watch, there's the conviction of the godly. So watch this. Uh, conviction is a great thing, y'all. Now, we don't like it at the time of conviction. Y'all ever been convicted before? How many of you have never been convicted before, ever? Y'all you know about to say, y'all be convicted right now because you're lying. But what's conviction? Conviction is when you do something and you're like, oh, that was wrong. You're doing something, and like right now, if you are, if you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing, God will convict you. You'll be, you're like, I shouldn't be doing this right now. In my life, I should be watching that. You ever watch something, you're like, man, I shouldn't watch that. You ever listen to something, you're like, man, should I really be listening to this? Y'all hear me? That's conviction. And so when the conviction of the godly are in place here, there's some things that happen. There's always signs that God is really moving when conviction is here. Look at verse number 17. One, there's a fear of God. There's a fear of God. It says that this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks dwell in Ephesus, and the fear fell on them all. Now watch this. Here's what we don't like, and here's what's preached consistently in the church today. It's this. Well, it's not a fear like it's a reverential fear. And yes, we need to have reverential fear, but I'm going to tell you this right now. The best fear that you can get in your life is a healthy fear of God. And you say, well, reverential fear. No, a fear of, uh, he's watching everything I do, and he has control over everything, and he can do anything he wants. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. Uh, no, but it keeps you out of a lot of trouble. If you get a fear that God's watching everything I do, and he controls everything, and he can do, and he owns me, by the way. If you're saved, say amen. Yeah. He owns you. <laughs> you are bought with a price. So you are his child. He owns you. He can do anything he wants with you. And there needs to be a fear. And watch, when conviction of the godly is present, there is a fear that comes with that. Not only that, but Jesus is first. Jesus is first. Look at chapter 19, verse 18. Or no, I mean, verse 17, I'm sorry. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. That they started putting Jesus first and when there's conviction. Not only was Jesus first, verse 18, there's fellowship with others. Look at verse 18. And many that believed, what's it say? Came and confessed and showed their deeds. Where did they come to? They came together. So there's some, some fellowship that happened because of the conviction of the godly. By the way, Hebrews chapter 10 says, you're not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I forgot to mention this, but every Wednesday from now until the um, the uh, strengthening conference, we're going to be praying here at 6, six o'clock. Y'all are welcome to come and pray with us. 6 o'clock, we're going to sit and we're just going to pray over it. I, it's amazing. I cannot wait until... Uh, that strength and comforts, because God's going to be in that thing. You're welcome to come. Six o'clock. Every Wednesday, we'll be in here praying. We, we did it today. Okay? Okay. Enough commercial. But watch this. There's fellowship with others. Don't forsake the assembly. So the fear of God, Jesus first, the fellowship of others. Oh, look at this one. I love this one. Verse 18 and 19, there's a fervent heart. A fervent heart. Y'all know what a fervent, fervent means? It's on fire. Now, that doesn't literally mean your heart jumps and, and burns on fire. That would be sickening. But you get a fire for God. When there's conviction of the godly involved, there's a fire of God. Watch this. Oh, this is awesome. Look at verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. You know what they did? They came and were like, man, I did this wrong to you and man, look what I want to try to do and they were confessing to each other. Man, I've got this in my life. And, man, I just want to get it right with you because there was conviction. There was awesome stuff going on. But look at verse number 19. This blows my mind. Many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their books together and burned them. Because when you get a burning for Jesus Christ, you'll start to burn up the sin in your life. Does not Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 31 say, our God is a consuming fire? And when you get a burning conviction in your heart, and you get on fire, and there's a fervency for Jesus Christ, you will start to burn up the sin in your life. I can't say that. I can't say that. And watch what they did. This is amazing. Burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. They didn't keep the books in the... They just said, well, I bought these books, and man, I just want to keep them around. You know, I won't read them anymore, I just keep them around. 
They brought them and they burned them. And it said there was there were fifty thousand pieces of silver. I looked this up. Five point five million dollars is how much that was worth. They got so convicted and they got so on fire for Jesus. They didn't care that they were burning five point five million dollars worth of books. Fifty thousand pieces of silver. Now I don't know about you, but when I read this story, I think, who's the dude that counted all that up? I mean, they're bringing these books and they're throwing them on the fire. They can't have them. In, they don't want them around them. They're like, man, I got God. I got. I'm on fire for God now. I got, I got the Holy Ghost in me, and there's a conviction in me. I got to throw these things in the fire. They're not staying at home. I don't want to hand them to Goodwill so someone else can read them. They didn't do any of that stuff. They said they need to be burned because they're of the devil. And they said, dude, there's five point five million dollars worth this stuff. Some people. I was reading up, just googling it because you know Google knows everything. And they said there could be a, it could, it, it depends on what they were counting and how much they were counting and what, what, what the silver was worth. It could have been up to $50 billion worth of stuff. I personally think it was $5.5 million, but I don't know. But either way, how many, I don't think any of us would turn that $5.5 million. But yet, we have a problem. Y'all, listen to this now. We, we want to stay on fire for God? I'm going to tell you, you're about to burn some things. If you want to have a fervent heart for God, you're going to have to get rid of some things. There's going to have to be some music that you just don't put away, but you burn away. There's going to, have to be some movies that you know that are sitting in your house that ought not be there. Oh, I'll never watch them. Oh, I know. But you get in a fire for God, man, you're going to put those things away. There's some people you ought not be talking to. There's some places you ought not be going. Y'all getting this so far? Do I have to mention much more? But when you get a fire for God, Man, those things will be burned away. You won't want them around you. And these people, there's a conviction. Now watch, this is awesome. Con- when conviction is, re- is real, the word prevails. Look at verse 20. Look at this. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Isn't that awesome? When the conviction is real in your life, when you, you get under some Holy Ghost conviction, when it's real, man, God, the word of God will prevail. It's awesome. But watch this. When the conviction is fake, the enemy prevails. I've seen this prevail. Look at verse 20. It says the, 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 the word of God prevailed. Now go back up to verse 16. The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. You see those two words? You see, when the, when the conviction is fake, those men tried to cast out devils and they were fake. They said, I, I cast you out in the name of Jesus who Paul preacheth. That he ain't mine, but I'm trying to cast you out because I want that power. And that devil said, uh-uh, the enemy prevails when you're fake. And he will prevail. But when conviction's real, my goodness, do the word of God prevail. Y'all get this? That's the conviction of the godly, okay? So you have the call of God, the conviction of the godly, and lastly, in the book of Acts, look at the confusion of the godless. This is what Paul's dealing with. Look at verse 29. Look at verse uh, 29. I'm just going to read you through this. It says, And the whole city was filled with what? Confusion. Look at verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was... You see the confusion? Now, if you read through this, and uh, we probably should, <clears throat> what happens is... I'm not, I can't, uh, for sake of time. But what happens is, the, the people of Ephesus come together, and they start getting a little mad. I, I should look at it real quick. I, I say that, and then I'm going to preach it. It says, in the same time, verse 23, the same time there arose no small stir about that way, for a certain man... See the certain man now? So there was a certain disciples, there was a certain vagabonds, there was a certain man. Sorry. That didn't pop that. It's an underline of my Bible. Okay. Then Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Dinah, bought, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. So you got this guy named Demetrius, and he makes these uh, statues or these idols of Diana, a god, a little g god that they worshipped in Ephesus. Okay. There's, here, here he comes. He's going to stir some stuff up. Look at, look at verse 25. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods 
which are made with hands. See you know what he just said there? He said, man, this guy Paul, man, uh, he got, got his group, he got his uh, groupies together. And he said, guys, uh, let's stop silversmithing for a second, making these idols, making a big bunch of money. He said, I'm going to let you know. There's this Paul. He goes and he's telling us that these idols that they're holding in their hand right now that they make are no gods. He's going through all Asia. He's preaching and telling people, these aren't gods. And they're getting mad. Look at it, verse 27. So that not only are this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they had heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of Ephesus. So they get this big tussle, and they're like, No, this isn't going to happen in Ephesus. This is what Paul's dealing with. And there's a confusion of the godless. And listen, there's always going to be confusion to people who don't know Christ while you're doing what you're doing. The dentist had no idea why Ava. Why would you do that? That makes no sense at all. Is that what her face said? I just picture her face right now. I remember getting an argument with a dentist one time. And the problem with dentists getting an argument is they're working on your mouth. And so I start talking about God, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm God. He's like, oh, really? <laughs> and he starts talking. Uh, he's in this, and he's, he's talking, and he's leaving all these instruments in, in my mouth. And I want to, I'm like, ah, I want to talk. And he's like, he ain't let me talk back and forth. They don't understand what we're doing. These guys, they were looking at their wealth. They were looking at their God. And he said, all oh, the world's worshiping this. Why are you doing this? There's a confusion that happens. And I want to show you this. Why confusion? Number one, because the motivation is fleshly. The motivation is fleshly. 24, 25, we looked at it. He said, there was great wealth. They were no small gain. They got rich off this God. It was a motivation that was fleshly. Out of human hands. Not only uh, the confusion of the godless because the motivations are fleshly, but because the magnificence is fake. The magnificence is fake. I, this verse just jumped out at me. In verse number... <clears throat> Verse number 27. I looked at the time. That's why I said, oh my goodness. Look, uh, verse number 25. Look at verse 25. We're great. It says, Whom we call together with the workmen of like occupation and says, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. This is something made of hands. Made by human hands. Look at verse 20, uh, 28. Look at verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, Great is Diana of Ephesus. There is a magnificence, verse 27, sorry, that's where I wanted to get to. Look at the end of that. It says, her magnificence. Now, I just want you to picture this for a second, okay? Uh, my wife is magnificent. Praise God. That's right. That's right. Come on, Are you saying that because she's not? No, I'm not. I say, well, no, she's not around either. Come on, man. But let me tell you this. I didn't make her. She's magnificent. But I didn't make her. God made her. Come on. Come on. Pay attention to me here. The magnificence of what God does is magnificent. But what these men are saying is awesome, is powerful, is mighty, is stuff they made with their own hands. It's faith. Look at this. This great God, Diana, in our hands. You made the God. It, the magnificence is faith. And I want to tell you this. It's made with hands. Why is it fake? It's made with hands. Number two, it mimics God. Verse number 27, he said there's a temple um, that uh, she has. Uh, verse number, the end of verse number um, 27, all the world worshipeth it. You see this? There's a temple, there's worship given to this. Look at verse number 37. Look at this. For ye have brought the, hither these men which are neither robbers of what? Churches. That ain't the church of the living God. That ain't been established in Ephesus yet. They come to this, guy, this get guys get together and he said, you guys are getting old Paul, but they ain't robbing your churches. What kind of churches are there? There's a church of God, the goddess Diana. And so it's mimicking God. That's why the magnificence is fake. It's made with hands. It mimics God. It misses the mark. Verse number 35, look at this. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, the men of Ephesus... What man is, is there that knoweth not how the city of Ephesus is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Jupiter? <laughs> they, they missed the mark. They're worshiping uh, something that fell from the creation. 
instead of the creator that created that thing. Romans chapter 1 verse number 25 says, They worship and serve the creation more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And when we get in a mindset that we start worshiping the trees and flowers and the creation, uh, when, when eagles are protected from getting killed but babies in the womb are not, we're in a bad situation. What do we do? We're worshiping the creation instead of the creator. Everybody getting this? They miss the mark. And so the method also. Why is the magnificence fake? Or no, no, no. The motivations are fleshy. Magnificence is fake. I've got so much stuff in here. And now watch this. Why is there confusion in the godless? Because their method isn't fair. Their method isn't fair. Verse number 28. What does a godless do when they're faced with opposition? And man, this is 2024. I, this is amazing. Look at verse 28. Verse 28 says, And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and what? Cried out. Now look at verse number, um, where's that? Verse 32. Verse 32 says, Therefore some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. Look at verse number 34. But when they knew that he was Jews, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out. So watch, their method isn't what we call fair. Why? Because when there's opposition, when the, when the godless are confused, all they do is just start screaming. They don't want to hear anything. I've debated people before, I don't say debate, where I will I will start talking to them and I'll start giving them truth and they'll be like, I don't want to hear it. You ever get in an, you ever get in an argument and you start winning as far as with the truth in someone's life? Instantly, someone that's godless will say, I don't want to talk anymore. You wanted to talk to me when you thought you were winning, but the instant things go wrong, I don't know, what is it? their methods up there? That's how we're the confusion of the godless. And you know why confusion happens in people's lives? Guys, watch this. Because there's no order in it. If you're confused, it's because there's no order. So here's what, here's what Paul. Paul's got a call in his life. He sees conviction of the godly. Then he sees the confusion of the godless. All these things are going on in Ephesus. Now, when Paul writes this, he's in prison in, in the book of Ephesians. So go to the book of Ephesians, and let me show you this. <coughs> turn, your, turn your Bible. Get, get over there. We're going to stay here. I want to show you a couple things. So he starts to combat all this. Now, the reason that um, this is so much in here, because we're going to go, the whole book of Ephesians covers all this stuff. It tries to, to encourage these believers and tries to show them the things that they need to do to combat some of this confusion and to, to bring conviction, keep conviction in, 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 a, in a godly person's life. The call of God on your life is amazing. What he tries to address, and we see that in Acts 19. Now he goes, chapter uh, number 1, verse 1 through 14 is maybe what we'll try to cover. But what does he do to, to, to combat these things? So look at the book, book of Ephesians, chapter 1. I want to see, see one. Number one, I want to see the preeminence that he teaches. The preeminence. Now, does anybody know what preeminence means? Okay, I don't think so. So preeminence just means this. And you can write this on your paper. Write that right down beside there. Uh, preeminence means first. First. Put him first. He comes, what? First. That's preeminence. He ought to be first, Jesus Christ. Now, here's what's amazing to me. Look at chapter uh, 1, verse 1. We'll be in chapter 1. Look, look, at, look at 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the will of God and the saints which are Ephesus, unto the faithful in Christ Jesus. He mentions Jesus twice in one verse. Look at verse 2. Grace be unto you, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. <laughs> Look at verse 5. Having predestinated us in the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together and one all things in. Do you think Paul's trying to make a point here? Look at verse 12. That we should be the praise of it, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in who? You see Paul trying to put some uh, uh, Christ in a part of these. He's saying, Look. There ought to be a preeminence of Christ in your life. He's telling the, the Ephesians, there's going to be a lot of confusion. There's going to be a lot of conviction. There's going to be a lot of the call of God in your life. But the one thing you never want to lose is that Jesus needs to have the preeminence in your life. He needs to be first. Listen, not your wife. 
Not your, not your husband. Not your children. Christ deserves to have the preeminence in your life. Regardless, he is first. That's what everything makes, that, what, that is what makes everything work. Go to the book of Colossians. You're in the book of Ephesians. Stay right here. The Colossians is just two books over. Uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I just want you to see this verse. I was going to quote it, but let me show it to you. He needs the preeminence. He should be first. Not last. He should need to be first, not second. He should be first in all things. And Paul says, look, I want to mention to you this guy named Jesus Christ. And by the way, Christ Jesus. And then later on, hey, this is all about Jesus. And uh, uh, you need to have Jesus in your life. And you need to put Jesus first. He mentions it time and time and time again to have preeminence in your life. Look at, look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 18. Paul goes on, man. I, I was... I was <coughs> I was so in, in man, I just got, I just bogged down in Colossians this morning. I, I was just all over the place. But anyway, I'm not going to get bogged down now, maybe. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in what? All things he might have the preeminence. Now, the context of this, look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. I'm just going to show you this. Who is the image of the invisible God? Talk about Jesus. So if anybody says Jesus is a God, take him to this verse that says, well, it says he's the image of the invisible God. <laughs> All right. Well, there, the, Jesus never said he was God. Well, yeah, he did, but the Bible says he's God. There it is. The firstborn of every creature, he's giving you a resume of why he should be preeminent in your life. He's the image of the invisible God. Look at verse 16. For by him were... All things created. I got to underline my Bible. That are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before what? All things. And by him, what? All things consist. And then he goes to verse 18. So he starts he's talking about all these things and all these things. And God is in, in, uh, the, uh, the image of the invisible God. And he has created all things. And he is power. Jesus is awesome. And because of all these things, he needs to have preeminence in your life. Not an Xbox. Not a TV show. Not a music. Not a sport. Not driving. I see a lot of teenagers and over the 18 years, 19 years of ministry, so they use a driver's license. Why well, go other places now? He doesn't deserve to be second. He doesn't deserve it. Not, not your job. Not, not money. Not people. Christ has to have first place. He needs to have the preeminence in your life with your time, with your talents, with your treasure. What you get? Anything that you have, anything that you're good at, God gave it to you. You need to give it back to Him. He needs that first. You don't need leftovers. He needs that first. The preeminence. Paul starts preaching to the Ephesians and says, Jesus needs to have preeminence in your life. He needs to be number one. No matter what. But man, it's... We got... Man, I got man, I'm getting busy on... Th you better put Jesus first. But man, I, I can make so much money if I just start the job here. You better put it first. He deserves the preeminence. Am I getting this? Preeminence means what? First. Okay? Number two. Go back to Ephesians. Put it back to your Bible. Ephesians chapter number one. Number two, I want to I throw this out here, and I'm, I'm going to try to teach this, but y'all need to listen, okay? Back to Ephesians, the word predestination. Predestination. So he, Paul's preaching, he's teaching, he's saying, look, Christ is out of preeminence. Number two, he says, I want to talk to you a little bit about predestination. Now, don't get bogged down with this. People, uh, Calvinism and the Calvinists, oh, they love to, to use this word, but I just want to throw this out so you understand. Anybody ever went anywhere? No. Some of you are smiling. I hope some of <laughs> people are like, what are you talking about? If you go somewhere, it is your destination. I'm going, we don't use that word, say, I'm going to Grandma and Grandpa's house. Well, that's your destination. Right? Do you know what you did when you said, I'm going to Grandma's house? You know what you did? You predestinated yourself. So that means God picks you to go to heaven or hell. No, I'm just <laughs> but, uh, you, know, you predestined. Well, you know what you did? You said, I'm going to a destination. I'm predestinating myself to go there. 
Does everybody understand that? Now watch this. A predestination with God is God wants you to go somewhere. It's already determined by him. You just have to listen to the GPS. God's positioning system. Okay? I just made that up. Right? GPS! You need, that's what you need to do. It, it isn't God picks and chooses people to go to heaven or hell. It's that God said, hey, I've got a call of God. We kind of talked about that. I'm predestinating you. This is my destination for your life. But you have to get in and go. You're never going to get there. God's predestined you to go there. But you have to go there. Is that right? Everyone get that? No one's lost there, right? So watch. Every one of you, God's predestined for something. I was going to say predestined for greatness. But that doesn't always happen. Y'all have heard about him, Stephen? Acts chapter number 6, 7. Stephen preached. He just became a deacon at a church. He went and preached to, do, at the Jew, to the Jews, and they stoned him to death. Now, that was great to God, but not so much great on the earth. I mean, could you imagine? Hey, you're one of the first deacons in the church of Jerusalem. Yes! And God says, go preach these people. Okay! And he goes and preaches at them, and... 50, 60 verses later, they're killing him. His life's over. That's where God predestined him. See, God had a plan for him. You say, well, that doesn't sound fun. No, some of the stuff God has to put you through is not fun. But he's predestined him. He's got a plan for him. And so, he predestined, and look at this, chapter uh, number one, look at verse four. He tra- one, he's predestined you. Just a, a few things that, that's general for all of us. The holiness. He wants everybody to be holy. Look at verse 4. According to he has chosen, there's that word, chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be, what's the word? Holy. 1 Peter 1, 16 says, Be ye holy for I am holy. Ladies, guys, you're supposed to be holy in your life. Um, I, I know I preach on holiness, but that is not a doctrine you need to leave behind in 2024. And he's telling the Ephesians this. Hey, God is predestined to be holy. Hey, guys, holy in your thoughts, holy in your eyes, holy in your dress. <coughs> this stuff needs to be holy. God needs to say, that's good. He's predestined. The destination's already there. There's already a call in your, God, or in your life to be holy. Number two, <coughs> blameless. Blameless. Look at the verse, verse 4. Without, he should be holy and without blame before him in love. Without blame. That, no one can look at you and say, I seen you. They can blame you. Now, blameless not inside of God. God knows all our sins. Someone say, Amen. He knows all your sins. But we need to live a life where people say, Oh, I don't rightly believe I've ever seen him do anything. I don't, you're talking about will? Uh, I always said this, and I've always said it. I've wanted to live my life that if anything bad was ever said about me, I would hope none of you would believe it. Not, I knew something was going on with that dude. No, 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 no. Blameless is, there's no way. Some of you, if then someone come to me and said, they did this, I'd be like, you're out of your mind. That's blameless living. Be a blameless person. Someone that you can't be blameful. for. He said, that's your predestination. You're predestined. Watch this, verse number, or, or um, verse number, I don't know, the verse down. But, uh, verse five. Having predestined, number, number three, adoption. Uh, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He said, hey, there's an adoption. Now watch this. Now, I won't confuse some of you, so I want you to pay attention. This adoption, it's of our body. That's what it is. Most uh, We get confused. Some people think we're adopted into the family. That's what that word means. Now, we are in the family of God when we get saved. But the adoption, if you cross-reference this to, to Romans, isn't the adoption the day you got saved. It's the adoption of your body when you put off this sinful one and get a new one. We can search that out. But you're predestined for that. That you're going to put this body off. It's not going to be there anymore. And God said, you're your destination. And one day you're going to get a new body. Uh, to you guys right now, you're like, why? I am so awesome right now. 
But wait till you get a little older, and then you won't be so awesome, and you'll say, a new body sounds great. <laughs> okay, so you are you are predestined to have a new body, the adoption. Number four, and there's an inheritance. Verse 11. And whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. See, then now there's an inheritance. Y'all y'all ever heard of inheritance before? You know what inheritance is? Y'all still with me, right? You know what inheritance is? It's something you get that you didn't have before because someone else gave it to you. And everybody hopes that their grandpa leaves them. He's going to die. He's going to leave me. A bunch of stuff. We inheritance, man. Woo! Well, God said he's predestined you to have an inheritance. Everything. This is amazing. I ain't got time to show you scripture, but I can show it to you. Maybe later. Everything God owns, you will own one day. I don't know about you, but that blows my mind. Because he's perfect, and he's awesome, and he's holy, and I'm not. And he says, I'll give you all things. Everything that Jesus Christ owns, I will own. That's our inheritance. Boy, if I knew my grandpa was going to give me my everything, I'd be good. I would be good to that grandpa. If your mom and dad said, hey, uh... When we die, you're going to inherit a million bucks. I think you'd probably be a little better to them. Right? Come on now, right? So God's going to give you everything he owns. How good should you be to him? See, his inheritance. He's predestined you to that. I can't go to First Peter, but you can look it up later. Number three, look at his purpose. So you've got... Uh, he says, the preeminence of Christ, this Ephesians, I'm teaching you that, and there's, there's Christ in this. Then he says, I've predestined you, your, desti your destination is already set, just follow that. Then he says, I want to show you your purpose. So look at verse 5, this is amazing. He said, verse 5 says, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself. Look at this phrase, according to the good pleasure of his will. Look at verse number 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will... According to his good pleasure, there it is, which he had purposed in himself. Look at verse 11. And whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Do you all realize that God has a purpose for your life? I know it's kind of hit on this a little bit, but he's saying to the Ephesians, he's telling them there's a purpose. You know, all this stuff that's going on, all these evil men and Demetrius, and oh, they're ganging together, and they were crying out, man, you had a, a big old uh, fight going on, they, they would have killed Paul if you went in there. He said, I want you to understand this, God has a purpose for you. Jeremiah chapter number 29 verse 11 says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, the thoughts of good and not evil. Do you realize that God's got a good plan for you? Money? For, uh, our good and his good, oh yeah, this, sorry. Our good and his good, though, are different. God has a good plan for you. Y'all hear me? So what kind of plan does God have for you? Good. A good plan. But listen to this, teenager, listen to me. Our good and his good can be different. When we think of good, what we do is we go, he's going to make me a billionaire. Yeah! Good plan for my life. See, we think money's good. He called it the root of all evil. Uh, cross, the cross, that doesn't seem like, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. That doesn't seem very good to us, but God says, that's, that's how you'll get life, is by taking your cross and following Jesus. I don't believe that. No, that ain't good to me. It don't matter what's good to you. See, our good and his good are sometimes different. We get confused when we look at the world's good. Our, their economy, <coughs> we think is for us, but God says it's according to his good pleasure. It doesn't come with the world's wisdom. And so when God's got a good plan for your life, and he does, that's a good, the good, is that not what it says in verse number five? The good pleasure of his will. Verse number nine, the good pleasure which he had purpose in himself. He's got something he wants to do with you. Well, I want it to be filled with money. No, maybe not. I want it to be filled with people and friends. Maybe not. But I want to tell you this. 
Whatever plan it is, it's good. And God says, I'm going to get pleasure on it. And listen to this. If you follow it, you'll never regret following it. But there's a purpose. He's telling the Ephesians this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's good enough to say, I'd love everyone to be truly born again. That's my will, is for them to get saved. The will for God in your life is not only get saved, but then get baptized. Not only get saved and baptized, but to read and to pray, get in church. These are some of the purposes that all of us have that God says that stuff's good. It's just good to do. And then lastly, look at the promise. Look at verse 13. And I love this. There's some promises, four promises I'll, I'll share with you. But look at the promises. Verse 13. He says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after, after that you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of, what's it say, class? Promise. See, there's a promise. And I can just see him. He called, He got a call of God. He, we, we went over this. He's in, he's in, he's in Ephesus, and he's, he's preaching to these guys, and all these guys are coming after him. And, man, all this stuff's happening. And eventually, Paul has to leave. He, he gets, and he, I think he tries to establish a church, and then he leaves, and he's right back to them. And I just want you to picture this. I just, I'm just trying to, to picture. It's not that this is going to happen, but just picture our pastor just saying, well, man, God's called me. i got to go away. i gotta, I got to go and, because you feel just how heartbreaking that is. We got a leader, a pastor, and man, God's called me somewhere else. And man, could you think of what's going on in their head? Uh, when I was, uh, I had a preacher call me uh, for Batavia, wanted me to come preach, and he said, "Do you think you, you're a pastor? You think you're going to, you've got a just a leaning to be a pastor?" I said, "No, I don't. I'm a preacher. Sorry, I don't. I come preach." He goes, "Well, I don't want you to come preach for me then." They told me, don't want you to come preach. And I'm like, well, okay, no, no problem. If that's not what you want. He said, because it will confuse the people. He said, what happens is that some people will come in and they'll preach and then they won't be the pastor. And he said, the people will start to think, what's wrong with us? No one wants to be our pastor. And he says, if you know you're not going to be one, I don't want to make them think you, you could be one. And they start to get discouraged. And so I'm just picturing this in my mind. Paul's writing to him. He's like, I know what went on. I, I get all that. I, I see all that. I know the confusion of the godless. I know all that stuff that's going on. And you're fighting this, this uh, great God, goddess Diana. But I want to tell you, in the midst of all that, God's got some promises. God, in the book of Peter, I think it says they're precious promises. God's got some things. He says, I promise I will do these things. And when God promises, he always keeps it. I can promise some things, I may break it. But when God promises, he always keeps it. Here's his promises. Number one, salvation. He says you can get saved. That salvation is given anyone at any time. Let me read you this verse. Titus 2.11. 2, I love this verse. It says this. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. He said anybody can get saved at any time. Anybody has salvation. You can give salvation to anybody. I'm going to tell you, that's a promise of God. That, uh, that, uh, uh, wait, I'm not going to be in church, though, if I talk to him. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the promise of God is someone can get saved. It's appeared in all men. People can see they need a Savior. So the Catholic at Fort Wayne, and he said, he saw about Mary. I said, Mary was, she had sinned. He's like, she did. <laughs> and I said, she said, God, my Savior. And Luke, I'm like, why would she God call God her Savior? If she didn't need a Savior. Everyone needs a Savior. Salvation. There's a promise of salvation. Number two, a promise of a seal. Look at verse 13. And whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. Revelation 3, 8 says that God will open a door that no man can shut it and shut the door no one can open. When God sets a seal, the seal is permanent. And he puts a seal on you the day you got saved. He said, Ephesus, people in Ephesus, listen to me, Ephesians. Let me tell you this. God, the promise of salvation, when he came to you, he sealed you, and there ain't no one taking that seal. Number three, he gives us the Spirit. Look at this thing. The Holy Spirit, a promise. It's given to us. We need to act like he's in us. And number four, there's going to be a separation or there is a separation. Look at verse number 14. 
Have we got? It says, which is the earnest of our inheritance to the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. Now, let me break that verse down. It sounds confusing. When I memorized that verse, I never knew what it meant for the longest years. I just recited it. Y'all ever heard of earnest money? Y'all don't know what earnest money is. Um, earnest money, have you, how many of you have heard of a down payment? Down payment, okay. Earnest money is a down payment. Okay? So they used to call it earnest money. So what God says here is, there is earnest, there's earnest money, or something earnest, not money. There's something I've given you as a down payment until I come and get you. Until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Look at that verse again. Until the purchase possession. You see it? And he says, before that happens, because that happened yet, that's when we go up, I'm going to give you something that's going to separate you from everything else. Like you go in to buy a car, and you give them a down payment. Everybody pay attention to me, I'm almost done. You go to give them a down payment. You say, here's this money, I'm gonna come, and I'm going to come back and get this car. And you come back to get the car, and he sold it to someone else. Well, one, he's smart, because then he got your down payment, and he sold it to you. Anyway, but you're like, no, I paid for it. There was this, that car was supposed to be separated. That car was supposed to be different. It wasn't supposed to be anybody else. Get that car because there was a down payment on that thing. God said, I'm going to separate you with the Holy Ghost because I'm going to come and get you one day. And I'm going to come and there ain't nobody else going to touch you or put a seal on you because of salvation. I gave you the spirit. Now there's a separation that has to happen in your life. And he's telling the Ephesians, I want you to get this. He's telling the Ephesians, don't give in. There's a promise that you have salvation. There's a promise that you are sealed by me. There's a promise of the Spirit within you. Now stay separate. Because yes, they're going to mock you. And yes, they're going to tell you you're doing the wrong thing. But I'm going to tell you there's going to be a day that I'm going to get up in those clouds. I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And I'm going to purchase that possession with that down payment. Just then, then you don't have to worry about this anymore. But stay faithful until then. Stay faithful until then and be separate. Because that's what he gave you the Spirit. Preeminence of Christ, the predestination, the purpose, and the promise. You see what he's dealing with? We're just a little bit into it. But the book of Ephesians, he has to deal with it. What's God done in your heart? Listen, he may have worked on you. He may have done something. That's what an invitation is for. Father, thank you for your holy book. God, thank you for revealing things to me in this book. Thank you for just a great study. And Lord, as we look at the book of Ephesians, I'm excited about what you'll teach us. But as we're being taught, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will move us. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will convict us. God, that, that was a great thought you gave me. Thank you. The conviction, when conviction is real, God, the Word of God prevails. So tonight I'm asking, maybe there's something you've dealt with in a teenager's life or an adult's life that they need to respond to you tonight. That's what an invitation is. We give it tonight, I pray they would feel liberty to say, we've got altars down here, we've got a floor, we've got the old rugged cross. We would just come, bow, say, God, you've done this, let me do business with you. But tonight, God, maybe there's someone in this room that's not saved, they're not born again. They don't know they'd go to heaven. They need to get that settled. It's appeared to them. The gospel's appeared to them. You say you've appeared to all men. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you arose that you could save people. But tonight, you're not saved in this room. You don't know for sure. Hey, there's a fakeness. When conviction is fake, the enemy will prevail. Don't let him prevail tonight. You say, well, I'm not saved, and I know it. I need prayer. I'm not saved, and I know it. I need prayer. I don't know I'd go to heaven. Or Jack, just let me pray for you. That's all I do. I, I say this every service. Let me pray for you. Lift your hand up. Let me pray for you. Anybody? Let's have some prayer. Father, you do what you can only do. I don't know what you did in the hearts of people today, but I pray you'd stir us up. As we look at the book of Ephesians, God, that you'd apply it to our life as well. Speak to us what you spoke today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If God spoke to you, why don't you come? God.